Right, thank you. <laughs> Before I get going, I want to make sure that you guys know that you can access a PDF of this talk at this bit.ly link. So it's bit.ly slash uvmfruit2020. So if you have a computer in your hot little hand, you can look at it right now. That PDF has this talk and the talk I'm giving in the afternoon just in one PDF. All right, so I'm Anna Wallingford. I am the new entomologist at New Hampshire. Does anybody know Alan Eaton or have any interaction with Alan Eaton beforehand? He was the entomologist at UNH for the past 40 years or so. Um, so my background definitely got my PhD at Virginia Tech, um, traveled around a lot, did a lot of research in different parts of the world, uh, well, parts of the country, um, worked with ARS in California, in the DC area, did a postdoc at Cornell studying spotted wing drosophila, um, did a postdoc working with brown marmorated stink bug, so those are some areas I'm really um, connected to. Um, didn't work too much with Apple. When I was a, a master's student in Virginia, I worked with Apple a little bit. So when the people at Xerxes and NRCS approached me with this project, I was like, oh, this will be a great opportunity for me to learn how to do my job, right? <laughs> so get really down and dirty with Apple IPM and how to improve pollinator protection. Um, that was probably a mistake. I'm going to admit it right now. And George Hamilton, who's our Apple guy in New Hampshire, it was very smart to pass it on to me. <laughs> and the reason I say it was such a challenge is that this project wasn't just um, an educational effort to say, you know, what are some things we can do to protect pollinators? This was to, to find that point at which we are defining the gold standard of pollinator protection in fruit tree fruit systems without losing any quality or, or taking too much risk when it comes to changing practices. So that is a big, big challenge. And that's what I'm going to spend my talk trying to explain to you, like how, how we're making these decisions. If we have time, I can talk to you a little bit about what the NRCS is planning as far as the future of their cost sharing program. Who has participated in a cost sharing program with NRCS? Anybody? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like some of these buffer programs where you plant trees between your, well, I'll, I can tell you about it later. Um, so here's the team. Here's Eric Venturini. He's the guy who wrote me into it. He was an employee at Xerxes Society, which is a conservation nonprofit. You may be familiar with their monarch work, with their, with their bee conservation work. Um, this team is a, across the country. Um, Mace Vaughn is in California. Kelly's in New Jersey. I think Emily's in... I don't know, they're all spread all over the place. But they work very closely with NRCS, promoting um, conservation practices, promoting cost-sharing programs, so that there's a financial subsidy to go along with you know, making changes to your practices. Um, they recruited us the extension team. Um, so Cheryl Smith is our plant pathologist, George Hamilton is our tree fruit guy, and, and me now. Um, since then, we have actually hired somebody. Um, Alina Harris uh, was a recent grad at UNH. We hired her to take over this project. And because I'm a little overwhelmed when it comes to commercial tree fruit, we hired Kathleen Leahy as a consult. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Kathleen Leahy. She works out of Massachusetts with a lot of people. She works with a couple. Does she work with you? Do you, do you hire Kathleen? Do you know her? Well, anyway. So I think we're staffed up pretty well. Um, Eric has since left to become the main blueberry commissioner. So he's jump ship, thank you very much. And ooh, this is a total aside. I'm on Twitter only for work. I follow one celebrity, John Hodgman. Does anybody know John Hodgman? He's a comedian, but he happens to be from Maine. And he recently tweeted um, a news article about Eric Venturini, Maine's new wild blueberry commissioner, and he said, everybody move to Maine and try to marry the new wild blueberry commissioner. So he's famous now for being some kind of blueberry heartthrob. All right, so <laughs> why, do, why do we care? I think you, if anybody, know why we care about this. Um, our pollinators um, are responsible for fruit set. Um, but keep in mind, aside from the honeybees that we hire in, there's hundreds of species of wild bees that work in our orchards for us. Um, and one thing that's really important to keep in mind is the more diversity, the more resilient that system is. Um, so if you think about this spring, how wet and long this spring was, if you were out there looking at who was working your orchards 
it was these bumblebees. Would you agree? You had a lot of tanks out there working your flowers. So when you have more weird weather like we did this year, having resilient ecosystem services is going to be more and more important. Um, I'm not a bee person, I'm not going to get too much into this, but if you want to get into it, there's tons of resources out there. Mia Park and all of her compatriots at Cornell put together this guide. Um, that link is there for people who download the PDF that I offered you. I don't expect you to write that down. Um, but hey, get into it. It's really, really cool stuff. Um, so the idea of this project is to use IPM and to integrate pollinator protection into IPM and make them both work together. So you guys probably have heard this before. You know what IPM is. Um, but just so you understand my philosophy on IPM, um, you always have to acknowledge that you have to tolerate some level of, of pest organisms and that there's a balance between the economic injury that these, um, dam this damage causes versus how much it's, you, know, you want to spend to control it. So that balance of damage to economic um, sustainability is really important. You're using multiple tactics to manage pest organisms and you use the pest biology against it. Um, and ultimately you're kind of saying, well, we're going to un avoid unnecessary applications. We're only going to spray a material in the orchard when we really need to. So that has some benefits when it comes to pollinator protection if you're eliminating unnecessary applications of broad spectrum pesticides. Um, and you are aware of the tree fruit guide and if you're not familiar with the NUA, you, you should get familiar with it and know that they are changing the look of the NUA website. So right now it's kind of hard to use. They are revamping that. I think we're, we're expecting that new face of NUA to launch maybe this winter and it'll be a lot more user friendly. All right. So some things that you can do to enhance your pollinator protection, to integrate pollinator protection to IPM. You can actually absolutely enhance pollinator habitat. So that's floral resources, that's making changes that, that reduce disturbance to nesting sites. Um, if you are getting really into creating pollinator habitats, you can go to this website, donate a little bit of money to Xerxes Society, and they'll send you this cool sign so that your customers know that you are what, what you're up to. It's not just like a crazy patch of flowers that look crazy, you know? <laughs> so that's an option for you. If you want to get really serious, they do have a Be Better Certified program. And this is kind of strenuous. This is kind of varsity level stuff, but might be worth it for some of you, depending on what your strategies are right now. Um, one thing that, 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 that was part of this that I thought was really interesting was um, ecologically appropriate practices. So limits on using bumblebees. Um, and when I say using bumblebees, I mean bringing in bumblebees from outside and establishing them. Does anybody use bumblebees, like buy boxes of bumblebees? So, you, I mean, I didn't realize this, but they're, they're not native. They're not from around here, <laughs> right? So this Bee Better certification does focus a lot on native plants. Um, and part of enhancing your pollinator habitat, they have this 5% um, of operational acreage, and that pollinator habitat has to be 70% native plants. I don't know if you're familiar, but there was a cereal company recently that sent out a bunch of flower seeds to help pollinators, and they were like all non-native flowers, and that was poo-pooed by the conservationists for a number of reasons. Um, protecting that pollinator habitat once you've established it. Um, flagging nesting sites, you know, reducing disturbance, things like that. Um, and of course, um, avoiding unnecessary applications of pesticide using IPM tactics. And I guess selecting the least bad pesticides, the most efficacious but least bad environmentally. So it's strenuous, but it might be right for, for some of you, and especially if you want to show your customers how, how dedicated you are to this. Some other motivations for using an integrated pest and pollinator management program. Um, aside from the ecosystem services, which is a clear benefit, we do have some sticks kind of coming down as far as regulations. Um, there's new pollinator protection language on labels. I'm sure you've been seeing that. Um, the restrictions on, on Laura's van, um, you know, we're pretty limited to how we can use what, what we kind of identified as one of the more dangerous chemicals in the landscape. Um, but we do um, anticipate voluntary eliminations. Um, and when I say voluntary, this is by the chemical companies. So it sounds like the chemical companies are going to stop making Laura's van. 
they're going to stop producing certain classes of neonicotinoids because they've just decided it's not worth it. Um, and of course, we're seeing some states individually ban different groups of pesticides. So this is something you just have to be aware of. Um, Vermont doesn't register Lord's ban anymore. Oh, there you go. You can't use Lord's ban. <laughs> um, there is a little bit of confusion with the national ban, the EPA ban, um, which, which did not go through because that was a ban both on the sale of and residuals. So it wasn't like you could stockpile it and keep it forever um, and use it until you cold dead hands. Um, all right, so th those are some things to keep in mind. And of course, our cost sharing program, which we are in the process of developing, might be another carrot in that carrot and stick motivation. So going back to the original impetus, Eric coming to me and saying, hey, let's do a cost sharing program for Apple in New Hampshire, because we did a cost sharing program for wild blueberry in Maine and it worked out great. So let's do it on another commodity, which to me is kind of like saying, we got a, a pet fish and it worked out awesome. We're going to get a pony and it's got a bunch of diseases and it's hard to, anyway. But this is what the cost sharing program looks like for wild uh, blueberry in Maine. Um, no insecticides or fungicides during bloom. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, they put a limitation on using systemic insecticides. And this term, systemic insecticides, it's kind of thrown me for a loop since I started my job here about a year ago. I did not realize that the term systemic insecticides is a term that's often used by conservation specialists. In the field that I came from, which is pesticide science, systemic insecticide means any product that enters the plant. Um, when they're talking about systemic insecticide, what they really mean are pesticides that are not only dangerous to non-targets like bees, but pesticides that have a fate beyond their original use. So a systemic insecticide that enters the plant, enters the soil, could go and have this life beyond its intended use. Lor's ban, of course you can't use Lor's ban. Lor's ban is not a systemic insecticide, but it's definitely labeled as one of these products that has this fate beyond. And that's why we're really trying to eliminate the use of this product. So that term systemic insecticide is problematic for me because there's a ton of products that are dangerous to bees that are not systemic, and there's a ton of systemic products that are safe for bees, they're not toxic to bees. So we'll talk about that later. Um, using monitoring thresholds to trigger sprays, that's classic IPM, um, and you know, a bunch of other things. And the, the point of this program is that they developed a point system. So if one requirement didn't work for you, you'd make it up by doing something else to make sure that that program would fit anybody's requirement. You got a certain dollar per acre if you participated, and people really liked it in Maine. So, we're, let's start with this for the Apple IPM, and I'm gonna explain why we've run into so many problems. Um, no insecticides during bloom, I think that's pretty easy. No one's using insecticides during bloom except for a few, few rare circumstances. But fungicides during bloom, do you think you can produce a viable crop without using fungicides during bloom? Who can do it? Anybody? No. So we have apple scab. That's like dead primary um, infection periods. Um, no insect systemic insecticides after bloom. Well, this is a bit awkward, isn't it? Because we've been trying to get people to swap a sale in for a lot of the organophosphates we're trying to phase out of. A sale is acetamiprid. It's considered a moderately toxic to bee product. It is systemic. It's one of these long-term products, um, but it, you know, we've been trying to look at this as a safer thing, and it isn't that awkward. Um, using monitoring and threshold to trigger sprays, that's a whole other kettle of fish. I'm going to talk about that. Evening application, um, I think that's pretty straightforward and easily adoptable, that you would apply these products that might be dangerous to bees during a time that they're not in the orchard. Um, restrictions on combining pesticides that has to do with synergies. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Creating buffer zones when you have problems with drift, drift pesticide drift, and of course, um, making up any, any lost, lost credits with education, which we're doing right now. All right, so when I say using monitoring and thresholds to trigger sprays is something that's kind of really, really hard to find in Apple, is if you think about the key diseases, like apple scab and fire blight, you're not waiting to find out if you have apple scab before you're acting to do apple scab. There's a lot of preventative activities for these things. Um, our key insects, apple maggot, we do have a really good method of using um, trapping to trigger sprays. 
But for Plum Curculio and Codling Moth, not so much. I think for, for Plum Curculio, um, there's not a great way to scout and, and time your sprays. I think a lot of people are going to be treating for Plum Curculio no matter what. Um, for Codling Moth, our trapping is used to time sprays. I know in West Coast orchards, they can use um, trap numbers to indicate whether or not to treat. That's not appropriate in the East Coast, and there's a few reasons for that, but using trap numbers to time sprays is, is, is not, it's not an effective way to time sprays. These are meant to, or, or to decide whether or not you need to spray. We use them to time them. So this is something I've been trying to explain to people in NRCS. They're conservationists. As soon as they find out about thresholds, they think it's a great idea. And they're like, well, why can't people do that? And I just have, we're working through this and finding a happy medium. All right. And of course, like talking to our growers, there's, I think we counted more than 30 individual organisms that people might be encountering. And every orchard is different. Um, every orchard has their own complex of diseases that they're worried about and developing thresholds for each of those orchards in a plan that they have to follow and that the NRCS is going to send a young person out to check on is really challenging. So, work in progress. All right, so another part of this is selecting products that are the least bad, right? So has anybody um, seen this? It's a pesticide decision-making guide that came from Cornell. Has anybody looked at this? It's a really, really interesting effort that there, and this is a work in progress for, for this lab as well, but this kind of takes all the products that you might be using in an orchard, presents all of the up-to-date data on the toxicity, and they will rank them as highly toxic, moderately toxic, low toxicity. There's also notes on sublethal effects that have been reported for those products, and there's also notes on synergistic effects. So when you take two pretty innocuous compounds, expose an animal to them at the same time, and all of a sudden they're more toxic than the two of them combined. Um, and this is looking at products that might be tank mixed, so the, the kind of products that bees might be encountering at the same time. Um, this is also looking at uh, potential environmental contaminants and those products that are used for treating honeybee hives for varroa mites. So there's a handful of commonly used organophosphates that are selective. Um, they're not toxic to bees, um, but they're toxic to mites. And we're finding that there's some synergies with some commonly used or you know some crop protection products. So this guide is uh, it's hard to it's hard to use. You know you crack it open you're like ah oh, good. This is going to have all the solutions, and the more you read it, the more I'm really, I, I, Scott McCart is the, the lab leader, I kept on calling him, like, can you explain this to me one more time? So this is something we're working on, getting to that sweet spot where we're not taking too many risks, but we're fi finding what's the, best, what's the best thing to use. So a couple comments. When I was saying uh, environmental contaminants, this is just an example of one paper that demonstrates the kind of environmental contaminants that, say, honeybees would encounter. So this paper, they were stealing pollen from honeybees coming home and analyzing that pollen for the pesticides that may have been in there. So you see the list of insecticides that may have been in there. Um, when you look at the co most common neonicotinoids, imidacloprid was very rarely found. Um, thiamethoxam and clothianidine a little bit more, but at very, very low levels. I bet you're wondering what those big gray and purple bars are. That was, those are mosquito adulticides. So these are um, pyrethroids. They have really, really low mammalian toxicity. They're used for, for treating to protect us from mosquitoes. Um, but they're highly toxic to bees. Um, and especially the fact that we're finding the slew of compounds <laughs> in pollen, these are the things that make people concerned. So it's complicated. Anyway, that's just side. So when you're looking at, say, the list of fungicides that have um, potential synergistic problems with insecticides, chlorothalonil is probably the one that comes up the most. Bravo. I mean, I don't know how important Bravo is in your system, but we found that it definitely synergizes with commonly used pyrethroids, um, as well as most of the miticides that are used in honey beehives. Um, they found cumulative oral toxicity over six days. That's pretty, that's pretty long. Um, but that's one where we're like, yeah, let's, let's try not to use that during bloom. That's one of those things. I don't think you're going to be using it during bloom anyway. Um, one that's 
a little bit on the safer end, one that has fewer complications would be captan. In this guide, they list it as practically non-toxic, no reported synergies, they haven't found any yet. Um, however, if you read the guide, there's all these other notes about this and that, and they're really, really dangerous. Don't use captan. So here I am trying to make the best decisions and running into problems. How do I make decisions? Like, this is the least bad product during bloom, right? So you see why it's problematic. Um, so what we're trying to do is generate tables that kind of take that tree fruit guy recommendation saying if you're trying to manage apple scab, these are the products that are rated excellent and moderate and give you as much information as you can um, about potential problems. Um, for example, copper sulfate is toxic to bees at some rates. So, you know, for organic systems, that's unfortunate. Um, so these are the kinds of things, and this is a work in progress. I'm still trying to get the most the, the most up to date information I can from our bee people to understand, you know, what what are the what are the least bad products to be using. Um, a couple comments about insecticide toxicity. You may be familiar with LD50s. This is um, a measurement that is basically the lethal dose that uh, the dose that kills 50% of the population, which is a bit macabre, but it basically says this amount is dangerous and the lower that number is, the more toxic it is. So the less material it takes to kill something, the more toxic it is. So there is a set standard by the EPA that defines LD50s for bees and that's how that high, moderate, and low rate is determined. Um, another thing is the synergies we just talked about. And a third thing, which I think is really interesting, is um, the RT25, which is residual time. And so that basically says, yeah, this is, a, this is a toxic product. But in a lot of these formulations, you spray it, it dries, and after a period of time, an animal can walk over that and it's safe. So that residual time, if it's very low, that means you can spray it in the evening when bees aren't active. By the next day, that product should be dry and should be relatively safe for, for non-target animals to be in your orchard. So when you're reading tables like this, um, that RT25 could be a helpful way to make decisions. All right. So this is really complicated, and I think we all decided as a group that we're just going to focus on early season practices for this gold standard cost sharing program. So the requirements that are super strict, we're just going to focus on early season because that's the highest time where, where bees are active in the orchard. Um, so if you think about what changes might you need to make in order to make your, your orchard safer for, for these animals working um, in the spring. Um, so we're kind of looking at dormant sprays, green tip to bloom. So San Jose scale, apple scab, apple scab, apple scab, a few kind of random moths, right? So these random moths, every once in a while people will have problems with winter moth or gypsy moth. Um, I've never seen a pug moth. It's one of these things where you almost never have a problem, but if you have a problem, it's really serious. Luckily, BT, so Dipel, is really effective for situations like that. So that's a really selective product, only impacts caterpillars. Um, so our goals, to set our low goals, eliminate Lor's ban, you guys have already done it, good for you, um, and eliminate fungicides that are known to synergize with other pesticides during bloom. Um, and, and those seem like pretty reasonable goals. So what happens to people who are limiting Laura's ban? Um, for San Jose scale, we do have a few growers in New Hampshire that will combine Laura's ban with, with their dormant oil sprays to kill those overwintered black cap. The, the picture in the center is the black cap is the overwintered San Jose scale. Um, there's some data coming out that says there's no added benefit to adding that Laura's ban, that that dormant oil is effective enough if you if you do a really good job and, and really, really do a good dormant oil spray, that you're, you're keeping that population at bay. Because if you think about San Jose scale, you can have low levels of San Jose scale in your orchard and have that population never make it to the fruit. It's only when populations get really high, which is like at each generation, they kind of move and move and move until they get to your fruit. So. That dormant oil spray is really, really important and it, and it looks like it's reliable. The only problems I've seen with orchards that have San Jose scale are people who had sprayer calibration problems and just didn't get a great coverage for their dormant oil. Okay. Laura's man for trunk borers. And this is something that we're looking at in peach. 
for peach tree borer and the slew of other borers that impact apple trees. So we really think um, diamides should be a good alternative. There's a couple caveats to that. So the product Alticor, the active ingredient in that is chlorantranilaprol. This is, I'll talk more about this this afternoon, but this group, if you're not familiar with it, the, it, the active ingredient works on a muscle nerve that only exists in insects. And this particular chemical only works on a nerve that exists in Lepidopteran insects. It doesn't exist in any other animal. So it's really selective. Um, when I say it should be a good alternative, um, if your borer is dogwood borer, which is a Lepidopteran, it's a caterpillar, um, it'll, it should work. If your borer is a beetle, if, it's, if you have a different problem other than that, then it won't be effective. Um, and there's a couple different things that we want to play around with as far as application. So with this, you should be able to apply for, a, for a, using a spray, like a blast sprayer rather than trunk applications, which is nice, but we want to make sure we get good coverage on those trunks too. So there's a couple kinks to work out there. All right, so what do we settle on for our cost sharing for Apple IPPM? Um, and this is a recommendation that we at Extension offered to NRCS. They're still working on developing that program, but follow the guide. You know, all these things, management of the orchard floor, you know, eliminate floral flowering weeds either by mowing before you spray something or by eliminating broad spectrum weeds, which if you have an aphid problem would be smart to do anyway. Um, evening applications, buffer zones, things like that. So that would be tier one. And then we're talking about other ways to use this program in tier two and beyond. So for me, this would be excellent because it would be a great way to subsidize some cool stuff that's expensive, like mating disruption. So a tier two program might be tier one plus mating disruption, which is something like $100 an acre. So that would be subsidized through this program. Um, you know, and other things that cost money, like, ex like establishing um, barriers between orchards and wild space to, to do that next step on eliminating drift. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> I'm sure that if they have success in New Hampshire, you will start seeing these programs available to you in Vermont as well. Um, a couple things that we're doing this year are playing around with these apps that are supposed to be helpful in the orchard, seeing if they're worth using. So we'll be going out and doing pollinator assessments with New, Ham New Hampshire orchardists to identify wild bees and kind of determine how much work their wild bees are doing versus the bees that they're hiring to come in and do that work. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. What was that website that you had for um, enhancing for bees, wild bees? Enhancing them? Yeah. That would be Xerxes Society.